says what I want to talk about. But let me just first add that um, what I'll be saying is going to be largely summary of the talks, main talks yesterday, particularly the talk of Tim and Kevin. Perhaps I'll add a few quotes, a few details, a few pictures, maybe reiterate, reiterate some points that were made or maybe make me add some new points. So I'm going to contrast, um, but my emphasis will be on Boltzmann entropy, but I'll contrast Boltzmann entropy with Gibbs entropy. But I, what I first want to do is um, talk about the two different frameworks for statistical mechanics, two different approaches to statistical mechanics, one associated with the Gibbs entropy, namely the Gibbs approach, which is the ensemblist approach to statistical mechanics. And I want to also talk about what I consider the conceptually the correct approach, namely the individual's approach to statistical mechanics associated with Boltzmann and Boltzmann entropy. By the way, can everybody hear me? Is it sound good? Now also in the title there's um, might versus mate. That you don't, you probably have no idea what the hell that's about. MITE stands for Microscopic thermo Thermodynamic Equilibrium. And MATE, you might be able to guess now. It's for Macroscopic Thermal Equilibrium. It turns out that in quantum mechanics, there are two distinct notions of thermal equilibrium, a macroscopic and a microscopic notion. This possibility of these two distinct notions of this kind, microscopic and macroscopic, does not exist classically. So it's really a quantum innovation associated somehow with entanglement. And I mention that now because I'm not sure I want to really talk about it because first of all, it doesn't fit in with Tim's instructions that well to talk about old established stuff that need to be conveyed to students. This is kind of new stuff, just a few years old. So I'm not sure I'll talk to him about it or not. It is kind of interesting, so I might, I might mention. We'll see how the time goes. Okay. Let me begin by talking about the word entropy and a, bunch, and a variety of notions of entropy. It was stressed yesterday, and I want to stress it again, that the very same word describes lots of different notions. They, these different notions presumably all have a common core. So the use of the same word in that sense is appropriate. But they are different notions, for, appropriate for different problems, for different situations, for different applications. And so it would be totally unreasonable to ask, what is the actual right notion of entropy? Depends what you're interested. Depends which notion. It, just, it happens to be the case that the same word is used for lots of different, with lots of different meanings. Of course, the notion of entropy relevant here is thermodynamic entropy and its microscopic counterparts, Gibbs or Boltzmann entropy. When it comes to thermodynamic entropy, there's already um, an issue that arises. There are two kinds of thermodynamic entropy. There's equilibrium entropy and there's non-equilibrium entropy. Now, almost everything about foundations of statistical mechanics is controversial. This is controversial. There are many physicists, philosophers of physics, chemists who believe, almost everybody believes there's equilibrium entropy. If there's any entropy at all, thermodynamic entropy, it's equilibrium entropy. Whether or not non-equilibrium entropy is a legitimate notion is highly controversial. My view is that it is a legitimate notion. That's a pretty common view, but it's definitely not universal. It was certainly Boltzmann's view. You would think it ought to be a fairly common view. If you say the entropy of the universe, which is definitely not equal, in equilibrium, is increasing, you would think you better have a non-equilibrium entropy. There's, a, there's presumably an answer. There is an answer to that. I, by the way, even what the second law of thermodynamics says is highly controversial. I assume it's not true of so many people here, maybe nobody here. But when it comes just to normal physicists, an awful lot of them are horrified by the notion of the entropy of the universe. What the hell could that possibly mean? 
well, if you're a cos you do cosmology, you're not going to be bothered by it. But for just for a normal condensed matter physicist, I mean, they, I'm just telling you, this is what happens. Horror, disgust. It's as if they saw Trump. <laughs> um, and the problem there is partly entropy of the universe, but also just the very notion of the universe is problematical. Again, I assume that's not a problem for anybody here. Okay, and now I have um, the cr two crucial notions of entropy, but, uh, which I want to talk about, Boltzmann entropy and Gibbs entropy. And then there is a question of which is the right one, because they're both supposed to be proposals for how to understand thermodynamic entropy, what thermodynamic entropy amounts to in terms of microscopic physics. There's a color code that I use, I tend to use. Blue is for good, red is for bad. <laughs> I may not always be consistent, but if, and if I'm not, you can, you can call me out on that. Now, bad doesn't mean absolutely terrible. I, 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 there are some good things to be said about Gibbs entropy, and not just what Wayne is going to say. <laughs> and I hope I, I remember to say those good things. I mean, there's some very good things one could say. In fact, it's because of the good things around Gibbs entropy, which is a sort which, which of provide, which causes there to be so much confusion about what's the right notion. Then there's Shannon entropy, which I don't know exactly what Tim is going to say, but I would say that Shannon entropy, while it's given by exactly the same formula as the Gibbs entropy formula, is, is, is for an entirely different purpose. At the same time, in recent years, some people, for example, Joel Leibowitz, has started calling the Gibbs entropy, which he had done for 40 years, always calling it Gibbs entropy, Gibbs-Shannon entropy. And I was sort of puzzled by that. I asked Joel about, about six months ago, why did you start calling it Gibbs-Shannon? Actually, I don't remember what his answer was, but I, I, guess, I guess because people in the literature are now calling it Gibbs-Shannon. I'm not sure that's helpful, calling it Gibbs Shannon. <laughs> now, that's a partial list, only the beginning of a much longer list. I'm not going to, some of them are in red, as you can see. You know what that means. Now, this homogarb Sinai entropy, that's not in red. That's that's a really important notion for dynamical systems. It's a property of a dy dynamical system. It's a number associated with a dynamical system which tells you, makes, make, it's a, a pre precise measure of how chaotic the dynamical system is, how much mixing is taking place. And I will say nothing more about it. There's Tsalas entropy, which um, was proposed by Tsalas. Some people hate it. Tsalas likes it. <laughs> Um, the main thing about Psalis entropy is you replace the log function by a power, log x by x to the n. I guess I won't say anything more about Psalis entropy. Now, in, in terms of mathematics, what's really very useful are relative entropies. And when it comes to Gibbs-like entropies, in fact, it's almost always relative entropies that one is dealing with. I don't know if you appreciate, all of you appreciate why it's always relative entropies, but I'll get to this, but I'll remind you of what, you know, the Gibbs entropy was an integral of rho log rho, there's a rho there. What the hell is rho? Rho is a probability density. If it's a density, it's a density of one measure with respect to another measure. There's got to be some a priori measure, and then you take the density with respect to the, the one measure with respect to the other, you get a density. That is a relative entropy. Um, now we come to von Neumann entropy. That is just, and um, I won't talk about it, but Wayne will. That's just the um, more, I would say, the quantum counterpart of Gibbs entropy. But there is also von Neumann entropy prime, which is not red. Von Neumann had another proposal for entropy, which, um, was a mixture, sort of, of the usual von Neumann entropy and the quantum version of Boltzmann entropy. 
Um, I won't say anything about my Neumann entropy prime, and I, probably Wayne won't either. And then there's something called diagonal entropy, which people doing um, research on um, approach to equilibrium in quantum systems have found very useful because it tends to increase, unlike the von Neumann entropy. Okay, so lots of different notions of entropy. Each is good for its own purpose. Though the main controversial thing is between Gibbs and Boltzmann, which is, which, which is the one that it really corresponds to thermodynamic entropy, Gibbs or Boltzmann, which is right? Of course, I can say they're both right. That's not my nature. <laughs> also say they're both wrong. I don't want to do that. Now, what comes next actually is it contains no substance about the issue at hand, but probably it's the most important thing I have to say for students. And it's, okay, so let's get to next. Warning. Foundations of quantum mechanics, foundations of statistical mechanics. What? <laughs> huh? Yeah, they're both in red. So here, I'm, look, so I'm sorry about that. <laughs> now, I should, probably didn't spend enough time thinking about whether I really wanted them both in red. So this it could have been a case of just not being so consistent. But I'm, maybe there's a reason, and you'll see what I have to say. It is, after all, a warning. So there's got to be something bad in the background. And the warning is this. My experience in both of these fields is that it's very hard to be a student learning about these notions of statistical mechanics and quantum mechanics because the foundational questions are, well, the first word you can use is tricky, hard to understand, but it really it's worse than that. And as a student, I was not able to appreciate what was going on. As a student, you learn all kinds of things on a foundational level. These things on a foundational level are just to get you over the hump so you'll start doing learning how to do the computations which work well, the physicists are masters at all of that. When it comes to the foundational stuff, they're basically clueless. They just repeat stuff that's been in textbooks. They don't really believe what they're saying, or maybe they do believe it, but if they do believe it, in any case, they don't understand it. They're just repeating stuff there, but they don't tell the students there that the students are not supposed to understand it. So the students might try real, real hard to understand this stuff that even the teacher doesn't understand. I mean, I had that difficulty, and many of you probably have too. So you're in a difficult situation when, when you're learning about foundational questions in physics, particularly in quantum mechanics and statistical mechanics, because you don't know what you should take seriously, which is a great deal of what physicists or your teachers are telling you, but what you should not take seriously, which is also a great deal, the more philosophical and conceptual the stuff you're getting is, the less seriously you should take it. But how do you make that judgment? Well, I don't know. That's the problem, and it's a real problem. But be aware that you know, there's going to be lots of stuff that you don't understand, and there might be a very good reason for the fact you don't understand, because it maybe it doesn't really make any sense. And nonetheless, the authority of the physicist is, particularly among many philosophers of physics, is very strong. So there's a tendency to think, oh, if the, if the physicists have said it, it must be, that must be basically true. We just have to figure out what they mean. So people, often what one finds happening is, instead of saying straightforwardly, oh, they were just totally confused, this was garbage, you say, well, that, they, you do a song and dance, put lipstick on a pig to try to make sense of something which doesn't really make sense. This happens all too frequently. And it would be best if it, were, if it could be avoided. Okay. So as I said, that wasn't really substantive, but I think it might be an important lesson if you could learn how to cope and engage with these difficulties. Ah, another remark about entropy versus energy. As a basic, they are two fundamental notions in thermodynamics, two important notions in physics. I want to make some contrast between them. It's often asked, oh, here's a novel physical situation. What's the entropy of a system in this state? And you might you wonder, oh, what could it possibly be? Well, it could well possibly, it might well, it might well be 
that the answer is that entropy is not defined in that situation. Why should it always be defined? As I said, many physicists say entropy is only defined for equilibrium. Others might say, no, it's even defined outside of equilibrium. But that doesn't mean it's defined for every damn situation you might, you might consider. In particular, there's no reason why it should be a well-defined notion for very small, for small systems. And I think probably it isn't a very good notion for small systems. It's a kind of, in that sense, an emergent quantity, a collective quantity. That's different from energy, from energy, where we basically assume for any system, big or small, there's an energy. There's a formula for energy. On the other hand, physicists are, explore all kinds of novel new theories and philosophers of physics even, even also. And there's absolutely no reason why for any theory you consider, there has to be a well-defined notion of energy. I emphasize this because in fact it's often assumed that the most important observable, the most important quantity in physics is energy. Now it is true, energy is an extremely useful notion, but it is certainly not the case that for, if you have a well-defined physical theory, there has to be a notion of energy. There doesn't. It is true that in classical mechanics and in quantum mechanics, energy plays an important role. It's also, I think, true that the notion of energy in quantum mechanics is in fact a different notion than the notion of energy in classical mechanics, although we usually ignore that, and it's okay to ignore it unless you're really dealing with conceptual issues. For all practical purposes, you could ignore that distinction. So there's a sense in which, okay, you, could, you, could not, you might well be considering theories in which there's no energy, and that's perfectly fine. If there's no well-defined notion of energy in general relativity, okay, that's not, the, that's not a disaster. It doesn't have to be. On the other hand, in this regard, Entropy might be a better notion in the sense that since entropy is not something which, it's a notion which doesn't depend too much on the nature of the microscopic details. You, you, any kind of system, entropy is involved, the notion of entropy has to do with counting and you can count for any kind of system. Doesn't, the, the microscopic details of the system don't matter. Where the microscopic details, the nature of the microscopic laws are going to be very important for whether or not even there is an energy. They probably aren't going to be that important for whether there's an entropy when you have large systems. Okay. John Bell once observed that, notice that in the following I shall not mention the words quantum mechanical system which can have an unfortunate effect on the discussion. Um, I'm going to stick mostly today to the classical situation. Wayne, you're going to talk about quantum, because you have to, you're talking about von Neumann. And I may at the end, as I mentioned, made in miter quantum, but for the most part, almost, it, it's a, this will be classical. Now comes the quotes. The first couple of quotes are, could have been in, perhaps in red. Okay, they sort of convey, I don't know if they should have been in red. Okay, so I don't have to worry about that. They can sort of convey the idea, one with approval, one with disapproval, that entropy has a, has a, has a strong subjective element to it, which it very much seems to do in the Gibbs approach. Gibbs entry depends on a probability distribution. So, first quote is Popper. I think that Boltzmann idea, Boltzmann's idea is staggering in its boldness and beauty, but I also think that it is quite untenable, at least for a realist. It brands unidirectional change as an illusion. I'm not quite sure what he means by that. But this makes the catastrophe, catastrophe of Hiroshima an illusion. Thus it makes our world an illusion, and with it, all our attempts to find out more about the world. I think what he's saying here is that, look, there are objective facts about how, about the thermodynamic behavior of objects. They shouldn't, they, this, these facts are, are, should not depend on knowledge or, they, they shouldn't have a, they should not be subjective. It shouldn't depend on what we can or can't know. They just are. Here's von Neumann. 
The time variations of the entropy are then based on the fact that the observer does not know everything, that it cannot find out, measure everything, which is measurable in principle. The suggestion here is if he could, then all bets are off, it's different things behave differently. Von Neumann was a really smart guy, as I think all of you know. But I find this a very strange thing to say. Here's Schrodinger making a very, very strong statement. This should definitely be all blue. The spontaneous transition from order to disorder is the quintessence of Boltzmann's theory. This theory really grants an understanding and does not reason away the disymmetry of things by means of an a priori sense of direction of time. No one who has once understood Boltzmann's theory will ever again have recourse to such expedients. It would be a scientific regression beside which a repudiation of Copernicus in favor of Ptolemy would seem trifling. That's strong. Here's something perhaps even stronger, also Schrodinger. No perception in physics has ever seemed more important to me than that of Boltzmann, despite Planck and Einstein, despite quantum mechanics, despite relativity. That's a dramatic statement. Here's a couple of statements from Boltzmann. I have emphasized that the second law of thermodynamics is from the molecular, by the way, Boltzmann's writing is kind of hard to, sometimes hard to follow. Maybe he doesn't always write with the greatest precision. Um, so this, these quotes may be not so, so well taken because it may be hard to follow. I mean, they're not good quotes in that sense, but they are Boltzmann and I think it's worth putting them up. I have emphasized that the second law of thermodynamics is from the molecular viewpoint merely a statistical law. Zermilo's paper shows that my writings have been misunderstood. This made Boltzmann very upset. Poincaré's theorem. Poincaré's theorem is Poincaré's recurrence theorem, that's, which said that from a gas in a, which implied that if a gas in a box was governed by the kind of dynamics everybody believed it was governed by, and Boltzmann believed it was governed by, Poincaré believed it was governed by a gas. The, the gas, however it started, and whatever, uh, for example, if the gas started with all the molecules on one side of the box, we know what would happen. It would, the gas would spread out or go to equilibrium, but eventually would return very close to the initial situation with all the molecules on one side of the box. That's what Poincaré's theorem said. It's actually an extremely nice theorem, one-line proof. It's, uh, so e it's really a, it's a theorem which is extremely easy to prove, which has a really striking conclusion. Poincaré's theorem, which Sir Milo explains at the beginning of his paper, is clearly correct, but his application of it to the theory of heat is not. The application of the theory of heat is that Boltzmann's theory of heat is wrong, because Boltzmann's theory of heat says that, that the heat becomes uniform and stays uniform. The systems go to equilibrium. Poincaré's theorem says they don't. They will eventually go back to where they started, far from equilibrium, if they started far from equilibrium. That was what Zermilo objected, Poincaré as well. So Poincaré's theorem, which Zermilo explains at the beginning of his paper, is clearly correct. It is really a theorem, but his application of it to the theory of heat is not. Thus, when Zermilo concludes from the theoretical fact that the initial states in a gas must recur without having calculated how long a time this will take, it'll take a really long time, that the hypothesis of gas theory must be rejected or else fundamentally changed. He is just like a dice player who has calculated the probability of a sequence of 1,000 ones in a row. Unlikely, really. It's not zero. Everybody here can compute it. It's not zero, but if they realize, they realize it's not zero and then concludes that his dice must be loaded since he has not yet observed such a sequence. That's what Zermilo was like, that guy. Boltzmann didn't like Zermilo. Here's something, another Boltzmann quote in the same spirit. 
The applica applicability of probability theory to a particular case cannot, of course, be proved rigorously. Despite this, every insurance company relies on probability theory. It is completely incomprehensible to me how anyone can see a refutation of the applicability of probability theory in the fact that some other argument shows that exceptions must occur now and then over a period of eons of time. For probability theory itself teaches just the same thing. Okay, so there's lots of, of exasperation in Boltzmann's voice here. And because people were having a lot of trouble accepting his theory, raising all kinds of objection, objections. Boltzmann didn't, think pe didn't find it, that the objections had much merit. He thought people simply hadn't understood what he was saying. I'm not sure the situation has improved that dramatically. OK, I don't know. It's just I don't want to go over too much uh, typicality. You're going to be several this talks here about typicality. Um, you, Rather than say much about it now, I mean, thermodynamic behavior is typical behavior. Things behave in a thermodynamic way because for the overwhelming majority of situations, they will behave that way. Analysis shows that. The very analysis which so impressed Schrodinger. It's, the analysis is not obvious. The analysis flows from the power of large numbers. Uh, we don't have great intuitions about large numbers, so the, the conclusions are striking in that sense. On the other hand, the mathematics is not difficult. Um, and so with typicality, you find you have lots of results. Typicality results say that lot, yeah, lot, there's universality, all kinds of different Situations yield the same kind of behavior. All kinds of different initial phase points will behave in terms of what we're interested in in the same way. It's typical behavior. It yields universality results. The framework in which you have such results is you have a huge structure and you're talking about some kinds of asymptotics, limits in which the structure gets bigger and bigger, um, maybe limits of infinite time. Um, of a long time, um, and statistical mechanics, thermodynamics, the limit, we, the main limit is the thermodynamic limit. The number of particles or the volume goes to, or both go to infinity in the appropriate way. And in that kind of framework, you can have universality, you have typicality results, and you have thermodynamics arising. Okay, now I come to the, uh, the first real point, the first topic that I want to talk about. And, and that is um, the two approaches to foundations of statistical mechanics, the two approaches to the question of what is thermal equilibrium. The individualist approach and the ensemblist approach. And you know what I think is the right approach. According to the individualist, a system is in thermo thermal equilibrium if it is in an appropriate pure state given by a point in phase space. Individuals, in the individual's approach, the main focus is on individual systems described by some phase point, the complete description of that system. If the phase point has the right properties, the system's in equilibrium. Otherwise, it's not. That seems rather straightforward. According to the ensemblist, it's not as, this is not so straightforward, and Kevin well expressed the difficulties yesterday. According to the ensemblist, the system is in thermal equal. So for the students, it's also something of a challenge to, to get comfortable with the ensemblist approach. Education is then such they become so comfortable they can't understand the individualist approach anymore. A system, and according to the ensemblist, the system is in thermal equilibrium if it's in an appropriate statistical state, given by a probability measure on phase space. If it's given by an appropriate probability measure, we say it's in thermal equilibrium. Now, 
that could be a definition of something, but if you're not an ensemblist, you might be puzzled why that should be a definition of thermal equilibrium. But in any case, that's often one of the, you know, a founding statement in the beginning of a statistical mechanics course. A state of a system is given by a probability measure. We hear it over and over again. That's a statement in the, in the ensemblist framework. Let me go on say more about these uh, probability measures for an ensemblist, as Kevin discussed yesterday. Back to equilibrium for an individualist, I want to give, a more, give more detail. So what is a phase point? It's given by the position. It gives the positions and momenta or velocities of all the particles, n particles, and position variables and momentum variables actually three end position variables, each position variable for a, for a point in space that's three coordinates. So six end variables, a six end totality of all possibilities comprising a six end dimensional phase space. Capital X is, represents an individual phase point. The crucial thing for an individualist is capital X. Then we have well, usually in statistical mechanics, one focuses not on the entire phase space, but because energy, H is the Hamiltonian, the energy function, function of the phase point. We fix the energy. We look at all phase points at a given energy. We get an energy surface, gamma. I'll assume mostly, I'll assume basically throughout that the energy has been fixed. So we have the relevant phase space is gamma, an energy surface. And then we ask, oh, let's divide up all the phase points into those which look the same from a macroscopic point of view. We partition according to uh, macrostates. Phase points which look macroscopically the same are lumped together. So every, each one of these gamma nus, is, each one of these macrostates gamma nu represents a bunch of phase points which are, would be difficult to distinguish, which really look, very much look the same from the macroscopic point of view. By what was meant by from the macroscopic point of view, that requires a specification of various macro variables, and there are various ways of doing that depending on what you really want to understand and what you want to do. A fact is that it usually doesn't matter too much as long as you do it in a sensible way. The fact also is, as Tim stressed, mess, Tim stressed yesterday, that it's easy not to do it in a sensible way. What is not entirely clear is what are the rules for sensible and not sensible. But physicists with good taste know what they should do. I don't know, I'm not sure they know exactly why. So here's a picture of the partition of phase space or of the energy surface into macrostates gamma nu. I have two pictures there. Both are awful. <laughs> the point of this picture on the left, uh, yeah, that's left, this one, is that it's really, really misleading because it suggests that these macrostates are all of more or less the same size and that nothing could be further from the truth. The second, the thing on the right is sort of suggests one of them is much bigger than the other, than all the others, not just all the others individually, but all the others as a totality, the collection of all the others taken together, it should be much bigger than all of those. I said this is also a very bad picture, because if this were to scale, you wouldn't be able to see all the others. The, bigger, the big one in the middle is so big that the others would have to be invisible if things were to scale. And in fact, that was Boltzmann's great realization. That is the fundamental insight for understanding equilibrium and approach to equilibrium. It doesn't prove anything, but if that's the, that, I think that was partly what so excited Schrodinger, the understanding that a picture far more extreme than the one on the right is really what goes on, is going on. Why that's what's going on, I'll get to. Now, so you got this Big, for the individuals, equilibrium means you're in this big set. Big, here I'm saying it's big. The, big, the one on the bottom is almost, is, is almost as big as the gamma equilibrium. The one in the middle is almost as big as the whole thing. And the system is in equilibrium if it's in that big set. Hmm. How do I make that go away? 
I don't like it there. Anybody? How do I make it? This. I don't know which one I pressed. Okay. Maybe it'll eventually go away. Uh, pray. Okay. So that's equal. What? Well, it can't be a really, I mean, is that you're asking, is there a theorem? There are many theorems. Obviously, they have somewhat limited applicability. Tim gave you a counterexample to uh, the general theorem yesterday. You can easily imagine not, not too unrealistic situations in which this ain't true. A another way you could, you, one way this would not be true, not Tim's way, but a somewhat different way, actually something which would be very natural from the point of view of thermodynamics. This is true for normal sized systems, gas in a box. Now if the box is the size of, um, I don't know how big it has to be, maybe much bigger than the universe, if the universe is finite, or if the universe is infinite, that's big enough, but uh, <laughs> really, really super big box, this won't be true. It's not the way these tests are usually defined. So, yeah, so how do you make it? What would the theorem really be? It would be nice to have a nice sharp theorem. But in terms of the examples people have, have in mind with the kinds of interactions people have in mind with the boxes of normal size and so on and so forth, it's, your calculations give you this picture. Yeah. Gravity, if the situation of gravity is not at all. Gravity, is that maybe, you, you, here's the, is that maybe talk about entropy? The, the usual issue of gravity, with classical, just classical gravitation with clumping. Yeah, this breaks down entirely there. Nice, interesting story. It's really important. Dustin has some things to say about that, I think, but he won't be saying them. You have a paper on it, right? But so, yeah, gravity. You know, gravity plays an essential role in, Pen in Penrose's work, Epper's New Mind, and on. And it's, it's, it's the fact that, and it's really crucial for Penrose that this situation is, does not apply with gravity, and that has profound consequences. Yes? Does the fluctuation theorem get, I mean, sorry, the, the term of Well, yes, it does. In fact, the fluctuation theorem is, is basically the formula on which you ground such a picture, and I'll get to that but I won't call it a fluctuation theory. Yes? Is there a straightforward way to explain why the box must be the universe? Yeah, but, um, yeah, let's say, because I mean, if, really, if you have enough, if you have a if system is big enough, anything can happen. But I, we can talk about it. It's not hard. <laughs> Kevin? What? No, that's the whole, the whole point is I don't have a theorem what to define sensible. Can you just, just, I mean, do you just mean like certain macro I, What I sort of mean is this, if you, if you, if you define macro states in terms of the usual variables with the kind of coarse grain you would naturally pick without fine tuning it to make things go wrong, things will be okay. Now, what made that sensible? Your intuition did. Um, or were there some rules you were following? I'm not so sure. Um, look. Tim mentioned yesterday that, and I'm going to come to repeat what Tim said about when you define macro variables and you want to give a sort of deta more detailed situation than just the very small number of macro variables that you have um, to define equilibrium, which might be three or four macro variables, but you really want to talk about an approach to equilibrium. So you want to talk about a situation where you have a non-uniform distribution of matter in a box and then it becomes uniform. If you want to talk about non-uniform, you have to have you can't just talk about the number of particles in the box. You have to talk about the number of particles in various small regions. You have to talk about the density. So the density, there are some variables corresponding to the density will have to be among the macro variables. Now Tim asked, how do you define density? You, the, re, the cells in which you count the number of particles can't be too small or rather it's not going to behave in a sensible way. They can't be too big or you're not going to capture the kind of variation you want to capture. But then you sort of know you have to pick an intermediate scale, not too big, not too small. 
Those are the kinds of considerations a physicist would make, and they would make with um, good taste, and they would, you know, they'd be right considerations. Experience teaches you what you have to do. Okay. Ensembles for an equilibrium. A system is an equilibrium if its state x is random, given by, described by a probability distribution, an ensemble. There are, and which ones? There are the standard ensembles, as they're called in statistical mechanics. The ensembles, the equilibrium ensembles, could be the microcanonical ensemble, or the canonical ensemble, or what I haven't written, the grand canonical ensemble, describing a situation with an indefinite number of particles, which I, again, I, won't, I don't list that. This here is a very nice formula. That's probably, this is nice in a sense because it's uniform one density constants. That's good, nice simple thing. But this is in a sense better. And most of the thermodynamic formalism arises from nice properties of expressions like that. Those of you who have studied how to extract thermodynamic formalism from statistical mechanics know what I mean by how you, the miracles associated with the nice properties of the exponential function. You know, when you differentiate an exponential, have to, the derivative is simple and things happen in a nice way and all kinds of nice things follow. And I'm gonna come back to this later. Just, it's good, good, nice formula. That's Gibb, that's Gibbsy and what? That's a, that's, that should be blue and red. <laughs> yeah, purple. Is there a question? That's fine, but that's, a, that's a Gibbs, the, Gibbs, the Gibbs distribution. Yeah, Boltzmann had it, but it's a Gibbs distribution. We call it the Gibbs distribution, canonical ensemble. Okay, now what about approach to equilibrium? Here I, I will give the approach to equilibrium first for an ensemble is because while it was very straightforward to say for an individual what it means to be in equilibrium, you're in, the, you're, in, you're in a state which has the equilibrium properties. You're in the, equilibrium, the big equilibrium set. That was easy. Couldn't, what could be simpler? It's not so simple what it mean, you mean by approach to equilibrium from the individual's point of view. It is so, somewhat simpler to say what you mean by approach to equilibrium from an ensemble's point of view. What you mean is, since, and, and from the ensemble's point of view, the state of the system, be it, whether it's in equilibrium or not, is given by a probability measure, an ensemble, then if it's not in equilibrium, the probability measure, rho, given by a density rho, say, is not one of the ensembles, it's in a non-equilibrium measure, it's not, one of, it's not canonical, it's not microcanonical. But it could still well be the case that as time goes on, that probability distribution becomes more, looks more and more like, and converges as t goes to infinity to, one of the ensembles, microcanonical or canonical. That can happen. That's called mixing. Mixing is a property of dynamical systems. It can happen. Physicists and mathematicians often try to prove mixing, and they can even do it for simple systems, but never for anything realistic. But it doesn't mean it's not true. It's, it's sometimes true. Systems are sometimes mixing. Nice thing to happen. It's a possibility. It's good. Yes? So here's the picture of mixing. I mean, what's going on when, when the initial probability distribution approaches the, let's think about the convergence to the microcanonical ensemble. Uniform over the set gamma over the energy surface. How could it get uniform over? Let's imagine we start off with something very far from uniform. So here's gamma, the energy surface. Set of points on the energy surface. Suppose we start off in some very small region. We like to understand how that very small region could get uniformly distributed. Now the dynamics is such that the size of that region can't, can't change, but what the, the shape of it can, and as time goes on, it can be more and more, I can't really draw, but it can be more and more convoluted, distorted, long and thin and winding all over the place so that for all practical purposes, it fills up everything. Unless you look at an extremely fine grain level, it, 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 the thing appears uniform. That's mixing. Mix, when you have mixing, that's the sort of thing that happens.
Was there a question? I heard a sound. Yeah. Is what? Is density a requirement for that kind of uplifting? That's a, the base point in the... Uh, is density, did you say? Yeah, density. Do, do the, if, if the system spreads out in the base space, do yeah. the individual points have to be densely spread over base space, or is that not a requirement? No, it'll be more and more densely spread out. Okay. Yeah, densely spread out, I would say so, but it's more than that. You could be densely spread out, but not be spread out uniformly in the right way. I'm not going into all the technical details. It's more than just densely. Okay. So, you know, approach to equilibrium for an ensemble is a somewhat straightforward notion, a particularly straightforward notion for a probabilist, for a dynamical systems person, a familiar kind of behavior. And that psychologically, can make you feel, oh, yeah, the Gibbs approach is the right approach to understand approach to equilibrium. I was certainly taught that as a student. Since I am a trusting sort of person, I believe my teachers. Um, and then as time went on, we, I realized, and so did my teachers actually, that that was just nonsense and we were just, just taking it for granted because everybody said it was so. And when you ask the experts, oh, why is that so? They say, oh, actually, I don't really know. But this is what it says in the book, so it's gotta be okay. That's back to the warning. What about approach to equilibrium for an individualist? Well, here's what you might like to say, that as T goes to infinity, eventually the phase point is in the big set and stays there. Or if it doesn't, isn't in the big set, it gets very close to it. Now, you would expect classically it should be in the big set because the big set is big. It's almost everything. Quantum mechanically, the relevant set that you might describe as the, might want to describe as a big set is such that you're not gonna actually end up in it, but you'll end up approach close to it. Right, but, but since I'm not talking about quantum mechanics, I won't explain that. But that's why I wrote, wrote or near because, with the quantum mechanical case in mind. And that's impossible, typically because of Poincaré recurrence. You're not gonna stay in the big set, you're gonna recur, return to the small set from which you started. So that's hopeless. Something you could have from an ensemble's point of view, you will not have from an individual's point of view. Stable behavior is for arbitrary large times, nothing changing, you stay there, you're stuck in the good set, you're stuck in equilibrium. You can have that situation if you're an ensemblist, but you don't have it if you're an individualist. So score one for the ensemblists. Um, but here's what you do have. Here's what actually I think would happen in, for a classical system. That for most sufficiently large times, even if you start off not in equilibrium, for most sufficiently large times, you will be in equilibrium. There'll be rare exceptions. You should live so long. There will be rare exceptions. And I think that's really what happens. If you, oh, that I find horrifying. I can't stand that, so I have to be an ensemblist. And I think that Boltzmann quote from the beginning is appropriate about the life insurance companies and um, about the thousand ones in a row, which I don't, won't put back up again. So it's okay, this is okay. Nothing to be afraid of with that. It's not a clean mathematical, well, you can make a clean mathematical statement, but the clean mathematical statement requires a few more quantifiers. So that makes it hard to, harder to understand if you would need more quantifiers. So the reason that the word approach is between scare uh, quotes. Let me see, yes. Is, is the fact that there's actually no time solution in this equation. Yeah, you know, I forgot about the quotes there. You're absolutely right to point that out. I guess that must be the reason. It's not a strict limit. Usually when you talk about approach, you really mean the limit. Yeah, okay. Here it's a more complicated kind of statement. Thank you. That's why the... Uh, so then it would be pedantic to continue with those damn quotes. Though the one, if you're careful, you should keep with the quotes, really. That's like the word measurement in quantum mechanics. You should always use quotes, but then you feel like you're being a pain in the ass if you do that. Is there a question? <laughs> Don't use the word measure. It's the recommendation of Bell. Yes, say experiment. And you're, you're really, that's really a pain in the ass. <laughs> well, there was a, yeah. Of 
So the Poincare Poincar occurrence and what fluctuation of what? From equilibrium, it's the same. That's exact. That just would be an instant of it. Instance of it would be the same estimate. Big. Too big to be. You know, there was a recently deceased mathematician, Ed Nelson, who believed that the, there are only a finite number of integers. It, the time would be so big that maybe it's bigger than that. <laughs> Too big to exist. Yeah. In that big, in that the big set. Yeah. How, how can you, if you look at a phase point and you look at all the six angle numbers in the coordinate, how can you say that's an equilibrium? What is it about the coordinates? That well, for, forget about how I define those sets. I did have a, those all those sets. Now the point is going to be somewhere. It could be in the big set or it can be outside the big set. It's going to be one or the other. Right? It's going to be somewhere. You know what it means to be in the big set. You might, maybe you're asking what how you define the big set. Well, I, I oh, no, but micros, I had, this was the micro, this was the, the square, it's back, I have to go yeah, back. You remember the square, but maybe I, should, I don't want to go back, but I will go back. Okay, here's your square, gamma, the sets. You're, you're really asking, this, you're asking, this is a microscopic picture. These, each point in the square is a, is a microstate, a phase point. I partition up the, I partition the microstate. Now, I haven't told you how. But we would probably all agree that if I have a gas in a box or a cup of coffee or with some milk in it, they're, they're gonna be, there's going to be equilibrium points and non-equilibrium points. Equilibrium points means the milk is uniform distributed, the temperature is uniform and everything, and that'll correspond to certain phase points. Other phase points, there'll be a non-uniform distribution, different phase points. The ones where you say everything is uniform and all the equilibrium properties of pressure is right and all this, that, and the other. That's the big set. Now, I haven't given you a precise definition of that, and I'll give you one in a, in a minute, but I haven't gotten there yet. One possible definition relevant to Boltzmann's work. Yes, Barry. I guess I was going to ask exactly what you said you were going to tell us about, but hmm, words like big and most occur all the time here, and they sort of want to know exactly what they mean and why. I'm going to give you numbers in a minute. Also why. Now, that's for your talk, Barry. <laughs> Yes. This may be, I don't know what word this is for, but it's something that has bothered me all the weekend. I think it's about it. Okay, let's good. Consider that partition that you have. And let's consider a collection of, of elements, of points that are approaching the boundaries of the two sides. Okay. I, I cannot imagine being able always to even maintain and differentiate between them. Right. But in order to have that. You're pressure, right. You're right. So develop. So maybe you want to develop a more. Yes. Yeah, so maybe you need to develop a, a better scheme, which is more realistic, so you don't have sharp boundaries. I, this is almost like the kind of question Tim was saying. I mean, you're quite right that uh, in a better world than ours, somebody will have done that. Maybe somebody has some kind of fuzzy notion of macrostate, but you don't want to introduce that here, which would just complicate things. And but you're completely right. This is not. You re, there isn't that realistic division between. Oh, these points over here look like equilibrium. You go just to, you, you go epsilon further, it doesn't look like equilibrium. Well, that obviously is unrealistic. But if you want to get an understanding of the phenomena, you should make that idealization. No, I don't have to measure. If I want it to be equilibrium, all I have to do is want something. I don't have to measure anything. No, if I want to know it's in equilibrium, I either have to wait long enough, can rely on the physics, or then I measure. But just for the system to be in equilibrium, I don't have to measure a damn thing. Eddie. Yeah, so I think about post equilibrium. Um, we define the large T as large time scale, first infinity. Um, how relevant are they to the phenomenon at hand? That is They're not relevant. We never, we, cosmological time scales can't really be relevant for the behavior of a gas in a box. They are relevant to mathematics. If you, to sometimes when you prove results, you just care about proving something about very large times. Then you might say, I'd like to get a better result. I would like to estimate the times which are involved. That's a better result. That's harder to do. 
And sometimes you can get results which are too good. And then you wonder, how could that be? Like if you find that you go to equilibrium on microscopic time scales, you say, God, that's a disaster. That definitely doesn't happen. You wonder what went wrong. So you can always do more and understand more. But the first thing to understand is a simple picture. And then you, you know, sort of make, you know, do some fine tuning on that. Well, we have, there, are, there are some results, and there's always room for more. Mm -hmm. Could you explain to me what you just said, that you don't have a natural language? So, so let, me, let, me, let me... Yes. What, what you might tell me is, um, we, we, you, you, this is statistical here, okay? And if, if I want to make connection with equilibrium, as we know, as a macroscopic phenomenon, which is like a classical term of dynamics, I, have, um, I know what a classical term is, or equilibrium is, but a classical term of dynamics. I measure unit quantities, I know that in average, this is the response I get. And sometimes I get these different responses, but they are very minor. This is why you do statistical physics. So well, to make the connection, you have to make a measurement. No, I don't. OK, so explain to me why. Because I want to, whether I measure it or not, you put ice in water, in hot water, it'll melt. Or any water, it's going to melt. That's, whether I look or not, we know that's going to happen. We want to understand that. We want to understand whether, why that happens because of, it goes, to, we want to, the melting is a go, the melting of the ice is. Yeah, but. Because any quantity you measure, density, pressure, enthalpy, they are all, they have all less the same scale quantities in this region. That's why you say it's equilibrium. And that's why you can do a statistical approach. So you cannot say equilibrium without saying that you measure something. Again, I, I say that I totally disagree with that. I think that's the source of all evil here, the feeling, the necessity to talk about measurement. Of course, when you check your physics, you want to, you're going to check it with experiments where you do measurements. But if you invoke measurement to, to get a conceptual understanding, you're making a profound mistake. The same profound mistake which has totally, totally polluted the discussion in the foundations of quantum mechanics and also polluted the discussion in foundations of statistical mechanics. There's a time and a place for measurement, but you're invoking it at the wrong time and place. There's been pollution in classical physics, which has arisen because of quantum mechanics. I'd like to hear what Shelley has to say in the remaining. Yeah, yeah. So, let's see. I have to go back, so this is not where I'm at anymore, right? Where am I? Good. So, I finished the discussion now of um, what it, of the various the ensemblist and individualist approaches. Um, Lastly, I talked about what it means to approach equilibrium from an individualist point of view. Now let's return, let me return to some history and give more detail. Now Wayne will, should correct me about it, historical details that I get wrong here, which I no doubt I'll get some wrong. 1865, Clausius, the notion of entropy. Crucial notion for this summer school. Tim mentioned Maxwellian velocities. 18, I, I said 1867, maybe I'm wrong there, Wayne. Um, there's the formula for the density, velocity density, the dis probability distribution of the velocity proportional to the familiar Maxwellian formula. Um, that's the famous Maxwell distribution. It's probably the most basic formula in statistical mechanics. Um, that's a nice formula. V, the density depends on V squared. That means the absolute value of the velocity squared, which means it's rotation invariant. One of the conditions that was mentioned yesterday by Tim. You mentioned it, right, Tim? Somebody mentioned it. Um, oh, OK. Rotation invariant. Notice also V squared. That means Vx squared plus Vy squared plus Vz squared. Now, the exponential of a sum is a product of the exponential. So this factorizes into a function of Vx and a function of Vy and a function of Vz, which means that the different components of the velocity, Vx, Vy, and Vz, are independent. And that, that form is the only form which does that. That's what Maxwell realized, and therefore he was led to this great formula. And he realized also it wasn't entirely a convincing argument. And what comes next is the more convincing argument of Boltzmann, 1872. 
And Boltzmann's 1872 argument was a bit too convincing. It convinced him of too much. As I will well, as, as Tim talked about, and maybe I'll explain again, but maybe I won't. So, you know, there was the Boltzmann equation of 1872 explaining how the Boltzmann function, and I'll explain what it is, approaches it's e the equilibrium distribution, the equilibrium function, which is basically of that form, the Maxwellian. The, the Boltzmann equation is an equation in which the density, appropriate density, does approach that form. At least that's what we believe. Everybody believes it. So that's good. Boltzmann thought that statement was of, of, of a universal mechanical statement with true without exceptions. Loeschmidt pointed out that because of the reversibility of the microscopic dynamics, that couldn't be true because if you have a trajectory which is behaving the right way, you time reverse it, it behaves in the opposite way. Definitely not approaching equilibrium, but going away from equilibrium, so it couldn't be universally true. And by 18, and yesterday in the discussion it came out, it took a few months for Boltzmann to respond. By 1877, the answer was in print, where Boltzmann did, um, understood the connection between entropy and equilibrium macrostates, which I will get to, which is a better understanding, gives you a better understanding of what's going on with Boltzmann's equation. Now, what is Boltzmann's equation about? It's always an important question to ask, what is something about? One of the problems with quantum mechanics is we have all these axioms for quantum theory, but nobody knows what the theory is really about. That's a really bad sign. One of the problems with Boltzmann's equation is there's a lot of confusion about what Boltzmann's equation is about. They can say it's about a function f. Well, that's great. But what does that function f describe? Well, there are two things it could describe, but fundamentally what it describes, I'm going to tell you right now. It's what Tim said yesterday. Here's what it describes. You take the one particle phase space, that is the box set of all possible positions of a single particle, and then you combine that with the possible velocity. So those are the possible states of a single particle given by a position in space and a possible velocity. And then you cut it up in a sensible way into small cells, small in velocity space, but small size in velocity dimension, small size in position dimension, cut it up into small cells, and just take your state, a bunch of particles with the microstate x, the phase point, corresponds to placing each of the each particle with a, each particle has a q and a v. Course, each particle corresponds to a point in that square. So you have a bunch of points in this square, and you just count how many points are in each of the small boxes, which gives you a fairly detailed description, but not nearly as detailed as a microscopic description where you test, say where each point is. You don't really care that much where each point is. All you care is how much are here, how much are in this little region, how much are in that little region. If most of you are familiar with this notion, but if you're not familiar with it, just forget about the velocities for a minute and just say, oh, this is the kind of thing which gives you the density. You have a high density here, low density here. Lots of stuff here, a little bit here. This sort of captures the dense state, not in physical space, but in the one particle position velocity space. It contains a lot of information, a lot of coarse grained useful information. These are the macro variables of interest. What are the macro variables? If you have variables, you have to ask, what's the, what's the, what, the, what are they functions of? Well, as I said, the macro variables are functions on phase space. They have to be functions of capital X. So this X here is the, the var variable. The Q and V simply label, in fact, different macro variables. For each Q and V, you have a macro variable. You have a density here, a density here, a density here. For each little cell, you have a macro variable. So it's the X, it's a function of the variable. In terms of the macro variable, it's a function of the variable X, not of the function of Q and V. And it's empirical means it's not a function of a probability distribution. It's a function of the actual state of the system, capital X. Just count. OK, so what I just said is written out exactly what it is over here. You take each of the cells. You count the number in, in, in the, each cell. The cells are these deltas. You count the number in there. You normalize it dividing by the total number. Then you divide by the size of the cell to get a density. You get a density this way. 
That's the F function, the Boltzmann F function. F empirical. A bunch of, now that F empirical is, now it's a function of Q and V. As the phase point changes, that function changes because the function of X, X changes. So you have F of XT, you have a bunch of macro variables combined into a single function on phase, uh, on the one particle phase space. X changes, this empirical distribution changes. The profile, the most interesting information about the system changes with time as the phase point changes with time and you want to understand how that change, what's happening. Well, somebody had a question over there. Yeah. Delta, yeah, delta is a cell. Delta is a cell. Um, N of delta is the number of particles in, configura in phase point X in that cell. Just imagine the particles sprinkle all over. And you just count the number, the bunch of points spread all over. You count the number in each cell, so the density. Let's see, X unit over, you're look, you could ignore what's on top because I just said the same thing again okay. down here. But a, think of X as a set. Yeah. Rem, remove the labels. Take the inner of that intersection of that set with delta, you get the set of all points in delta. Okay. I just said the same thing in two different ways, so that just confuses everybody. So. But you know, so if you're a logician, you like to write things in set theoretic terms maybe, or, or set theorists, anyway, they said it in two different ways. The important point is, and I'm like, maybe I come to the next thing. The question that you have that Boltzmann faced is, how does this thing change with time? X of t changes in a complicated way. It's a detailed microscopic dynamics. It's a hell of a complicated mess. The hope could be, the hope was, and this is what Boltzmann showed, that though X of t, the actual microscopic phase point, changes in a complicated way, this cross-grained information, these macro variables change in a fairly regular way. And in fact, in such a way that they settle down to an equilibrium, to a single phase, to a single function F, F equilibrium, basically given by the Maxwellian. And that is what Boltzmann claimed to prove. And for physicists, all for physicists, physicists purposes, he did prove for mathematical purposes, there's still work to be done deriving Boltzmann equation from the microscopic dynamics. This is what it sort of would mean. Here is the exact evolution of the F function, depending on how the phase point evolves. What you show is that this is well approximated by a function, of, another function of T, which satisfies exactly this equation. This is the solution to Boltzmann's equation. And the claim was that the actual evolving F function, the empirical distribution, follows a path very close to one satisfying that equation. That's what you mean. If you can show that, you've, you've proven Boltzmann equation. Of course, showing that means saying what you mean, and what limit is that true, and so on and so forth. It's hard work. But that's the basic idea. Okay. What are the consequences if, it, if that's true? Well, Boltzmann argued using his H theorem, and it's, though not a rigorous argument, it's fairly convincing and it should be true, that as time goes on, you indeed get that the empirical distribution converges to the equilibrium distribution. Okay. Okay, so first consequence is something you want. System, you have an explicit expression of the system converging to equilibrium and not just that, but how it converges to equilibrium. The evolution equation for the macro variables, how those macro variables evolve and evolve in such a way that they converge to equilibrium. And a crucial ingredient in that was the H theorem. There's this function that Boltzmann, Boltzmann discovered that the H function, basically integral of F log F integrated over the one particle space, QDV, integrated to QDV, one particle. That function, just by computation, you check it, you plug into the equation, you see that that cannot be, go up. It can only stay the same or go down. And it only stays the same with, for this for equilibrium 
Otherwise, it will go down. Well, that's not quite right what I just said, but I mean, I'm not going to worry about that. Now, the, for, now I can make contact with entropy. Boltzmann really wanted to understand what, 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 did entropy, what does entropy mean in microscopic terms. And here he found something which behaves in a monotonic way in microscopic terms. So it would be a natural thought that it, this thing is somehow connected to the entropy. Of course, it couldn't quite be the entropy. The entropy is supposed to go up, and this is going down. But you put a minus sign in it, and it behaves the right way. It's not extensive because I normalized F, so you, to take care of, to, to make it extensive, you put in the number of particles. Entropy should be proportional to the number of particles. So he had this proposal then for entropy in microscopic terms, given by the Boltzmann H function. It's the minus sign. I'll come, to quote, I'll come to quote fluctuations in a second. But yes, it can, but they're going to be rare and one, tiny. But this one can't. This one what? This one cannot. Uh, sort of yes, it can, but not according to the Boltzmann equation. But the Boltzmann equation is not attacked. The Boltzmann equation doesn't see those fluctuations. Ah, okay. Remember, let's go back. You see, this is, you have to be careful. See these squiggles here? Very important. Okay. Yeah. okay. So, not only did Boltzmann have the entropy, he, and he was very excited about what I'm about to say, he said he had non-equilibrium entropy. He had extended entropy to non-equilibrium. Because he has an entropy not just for the equilibrium F, but for any F. There's the formula for any F. He has discovered even, he's extended entropy outside of equilibrium. As I said, it remains controversial. And you know how people are. They don't, if some, if a person says, uh, doesn't like, um, somehow non-equilibrium entropy, they will not just, often they'll be, they won't just say, oh, I don't believe that's a good notion. They will even deny that Boltzmann liked that notion, which he definitely liked that notion because he proposed it and emphasized it. Non-equilibrium entropy. For these macro variables, the F, F empirical, these macro variables. Now we come to Gibbs entropy. Well, we already came to Gibbs entropy in a sense. With the minus sign here, that's a Gibbs, that's a formula for, that's the Gibbs entropy formula, integral F log F, or minus the integral F log F. Well, there you have it, Gibbs. Of course, that's just for a situation of the Boltzmann equation, where the Boltzmann, which is, I don't know if I said it, but I did say it, I didn't say it, but it was on the transparency. At low, this is only for a low density gas. It won't hold. This equation will not hold at higher density. It's only a limit of low density gas, something called the Boltzmann grad limit, um, where though there are interactions, the interactions are so fused to, not to introduce any kind of correlation which mess you up somehow. They have to, they obviously have to be interactions, otherwise you're not going to have the Boltzmann equation. I should have mentioned this term on the right-hand side of the Boltzmann equation, which I'm not writing down. That's the, that's the famous term, which is quadratic in F. Quadratic in F because a collision involves two different velocities, V and V prime coming together. Two different velocities means two different Fs, which count the number for each kind of velocity, F times F, the right kind. So it's quadratic, and anyway, the details are not important here. All right, so the wrong term, wrong term. At low density, one believes that the particles are basically independent so that if you have a one particle distribution, F of QV, you have the same distribution for every particle and the total probability distribution for all n particles is just the product. Particles are independent. So you just take the product of, uh, of that F for over all the particles, over all I, and you get a density on probability distribution on phase space like um, Kevin talked about yesterday. This is at only at low density. But in this situation, and I suppose, let's take with, now with, with, the, with the probability distribution rho on phase space, let's consider now the Gibbs entropy inter, minus the integral of rho log rho. You could consider that's well defined for any rho. 
But let's consider it for this particular row, which, which is this product row, product of the Fs. This one thing that's my, you, a good way to think about this integral row log row, integral row of anything is the expectation value of that thing. So this is just the expectation value of the log. The log of a product is the sum of the logs. So this is the expectation value of a sum of logs. The expectation value of a sum is the sum of the expectation value. So that's just the expect, the sum of, that's just the sum that we end term. So it's going to be n times the expectation value of a, involving a single f. But that expectation value involving a single f was just this. So when you compute this thing here, this, with this row, what you end up with is n times h with the minus sign, if you put a minus sign. That's just what you get. So it becomes natural to say, suggest, oh, suppose we go to much higher density, not at low density anymore. What's going to change if you have higher densities? Well, then the collisions are really important. They're going to produce correlations which cannot be ignored. You're not going to, the particles will no longer be independent. So the, the row is not going to be this product row anymore, but it'll be a more general, more complicated row. But we can still use this same formula for the entropy. It's just that row is no longer the simple one that we had before. That's the wrong turn, but I think it motivates a lot of the uh, on this view that, ah, the right entropy is the Gibbs entropy. Just a natural situation, a natural extension of what Boltzmann discovered to higher density. Why is it a wrong turn? Because this doesn't, want, for one thing, it, for one thing, as was mentioned yesterday, it doesn't change with time, so it's a pretty bad candidate for entropy, which is whatever entropy is supposed to do, it ought to change with time to increase as, to equilibrium, as, as you approach equilibrium. This is bad for the second law. It's not incompatible with the second law, but it's useless for the second law. Not incompatible, because the second law says entropy can't go down, but, but staying the same ain't what you want. That was the wrong turn. Let's do the right turn. We come back to the macrostates again. Now let's look at macrostates. Now I can be specific. The macrostates corresponding to this, to an F. So we, spend, we, we take an F of Q and V. Not empirical, just an F of Q, a function of Q and V. Take any function of Q and V. And we look at all empirical distribution, F sub X, which are close to that F, which look the same as that F, more or less the same. I'm not going to say what exactly I mean by close. These, Epsilons would have to be put on to say exactly what gamma F is, ignore that. So we look at all the set, the set of base points for, for which the macro variables F sub X, of Q and V, approach, approximate this specified F. That's gamma F. The news from before, we had gamma nu, now the nu is replaced by F. Each F is a mac, describes a macro state. And what Boltzmann did, and going from 1872 to 1877, was he considered how these different macrostates vary, depend on F. And in particular, you just, he just considered the crudest detail about these macrostates, namely how big they are. That's really what's most relevant. And he was able to compute, and those of you who have taken a statistical mechanics course have seen the computation involving n factorial and Stirling's formula. You do a computation and you find the volume, that's absolute value here means volume, the volume of these macrostates depend on f through the h function. That's where the h function appears in this, this is the fluctuation formula, but I'm not, kind of, not going to call it a fluctuation formula. That's where the h function appears. It gives you the size of the macrostates and it appears in the exponent with a minus sign in front. And with a big N and an N, and N is big. And that's important. So Boltzmann did that computation. Ben, let's say 10 to the 20, maybe 10 to the 23, something like Avogadro's number. Big, big number. Huge. And then it's in the exponent. Now you take the log of this thing. You get minus the h function, minus exactly what Boltzmann called the entropy before, minus n times h the log of the volume of that thing. That suggests the correct, the right turn. If you're not at low density, you could still consider the same Fs, 
but the, gamma, the energy surface is going to change. The computation will be different. This formula will no longer be correct, but there'll still be these sets gamma f. They'll be different from before. They'll have volumes. You, so that you still can define the entropy in terms of these volumes. It's just that you won't have this formula anymore. The entropy will not be given in terms of the h function anymore, but it will still be the log of the volume. That picture we had, maybe I still have, yeah, it's right here. This picture still is still just as valid as before, which means it's not at all valid because whether we're at low density, high density with the h function or not with this, this picture doesn't correspond. Nobody drew this using, in fact, what exactly the f was, what the macro variables were. So this schematic picture is set just as good as for either case. Same picture, same analysis works. Why should entropy be increasing in either case? Because you're going to tend to go, why should you have an H theorem? Why should, you have, why should that have been an H function? which goes down, or minus, why should minus it have gone up? Going up simply corresponds to going to sets with bigger, with bigger size. So you somehow have a good feeling for why the H function was an H function for Boltzmann equation. If it predicted the opposite, something had to be wrong. It would be impossible, actually. Um, and now what about how, how big these things are? There's going to be a maximum H. A maximum, the H function, H of F, is maximum at equilibrium. If you're, if you're not in equilibrium in a serious way, I mean epsilon of way, you're significantly away from equilibrium, so you notice you're not in equilibrium. H of F for a non-equilibrium F is going to be substantially different, noticeably different, epsilon different at least, from uh, the equilibrium H. You multiply that, that by 10 to the 20, you get a huge number. So the ratio of the size of the equilibrium set to the, any non-equilibrium set, or to the totality of all of them really, is going to be a really tiny number because n is such a big number. And so, let's see, that's, how small is that? You're going to, the size of the this ratio of the big, of small to the big is going to be basically a number that small. Really, you're talking about enormous smallness. That's why invisible. That's just so small, you don't see it. Um, let's see. Yeah, I'm almost ready. I'm almost finished. Yeah, so that is the Boltzmann entropy. Since this is a talk on Boltzmann entropy, I ought to have a sl slide saying Boltzmann entropy. This just repeats what I said before. Um, we had, this is what Boltzmann concluded. But this, by the Boltzmann computation, is just the log of the volume of the macrostate. That's the Boltzmann entropy, which, in fact, it agrees with the Gibbs entropy in the following sense. If rho is uniform over a particular macrostate, if rho is uniform over a macrostate, and you compute integral rho log rho, the expectation of log rho really. And what is rho going to be if it's uniform over a macrostate? It's going to be 1 over, if it's normalized, it's going to be 1 over, it's going to be constant, if it's uniform, 1 over the volume of the macrostate. Log of 1 over the volume of the macrostate. That's what you're averaging, but that's just a constant. So that's minus the log of the macrostate. So if, 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 you're, if rho is uniform over a macrostate, what you're going to get is going to be the Boltzmann entropy for any phase point in that macrostate. So you get, in that sense, you have agreement between Boltzmann and Gibbs entropies when rho is uniform over macrostate. For, for, for lots of reasonable rows, you're going to have agreement. OK. Oh, this picture I want to emphasize. Here's what we see in the real world, so to speak. We don't notice the microscopic details, but we notice macro variables. And when we look in our world and see how things are behaving, we look at these macro variables in particular, it looks like there's an attractor, the equilibrium phase point. And the Boltzmann equation says exactly how the equilibrium phase point is, attracts everything else, as the picture indicates. And that gives you the, pet, the idea that, oh, there's a special po phase point which somehow every, pulls everything into it. There must be some law of nature which is telling us that some nature prefers uniformity or something like that. But if we look at what's really going on, look at the picture from the microscopic point of view, and the microscopic picture, this, instead of this picture, you have 
This point here is just this big thing. And all of these owls going here are simply because you end up in the, you're going to actually just end up in the big thing. Not, not because, the reason is not because there's something special about uniformity per se that nature likes it. In fact, with gravitation, it doesn't happen. This what's special is that there's a big set and you want, you're going to tend to go there. Here, so here's Boltzmann summarizing the situation. One should not forget that the Maxwell distribution is not a state in which each molecule has a definite position and velocity and which is thereby attained when the position and velocity of each molecule approach these definite values asymptotically. Maxwell distribution doesn't correspond to a particular phase point to which you converge. It is in no way a special singular distribution which is to be contrasted to infinitely many more non-Maxwellian distributions. Here he says one thing and he means the opposite. I mean, in fact, no, the wrong way. In fact, it is a special distribution which is to be contrasted with infinitely many more, but that's a misleading. What he really wants to say is that's misleading because from the more fundamental point of view, this isn't anything special. This is a, the, the least special thing of all. It's the big thing. The, the things out here are the ones that are special. That's what Boltzmann really has in mind. Maybe I should finish the quote. Um, rather, it is characterized by the fact that by far the largest number of possible velocity distributions, which means phase points, have the characteristic properties of the Maxwell distribution. By far the largest number of phase points have the or I guess Maxwell gives rise to Maxwellian velocity distributions. He's saying this is big. It's set that corresponds to Maxwellian velocity distributions. And compared to these, there are only a relatively small number of possible distributions, that is phase points, that deviate significantly from Maxwell's. Whereas Hermilo says that the number of states that finally lead to the Maxwellian state is small compared to all possible states because of Poincare recurrence. I, I assert on the contrary that by far the largest number of possible states are Maxwellian and that the number that deviate from the Maxwellian state is vanishingly small, 10 to the minus 10 to the 20 by comparison. That's not such an easy quote because the way he, he doesn't actually say precisely what he means and he uses words and it may be the bad, it's a bad translation too but people told me it's not that much clearer in the German. But if you actually understand the picture, then you understand what he's saying. And if you don't understand the picture, you might have a lot of trouble with what Boltzmann is saying. So that's a problem. The value of Gibbs entropy, and with this I will close. I'll mention two reasons that it is, that it's extremely valuable. It's easy to compute with it. Suppose you want to actually know the equilibrium values for a gas in a box at a certain energy and a certain volume. Well, you could one way you pick a phase point and compute for that phase point, one of the typical phase points in the big. First of all, you have to pick one, and you have to describe a particular phase point. You have to give 10 to the 23 or something coordinates, and then do What are you crazy? Another much, a much simpler thing to do is to notice all I, if I take the average, I'm going to find the t those values because of that picture. Almost all phase points have, the t have those values with small errors. So if you don't worry about the exact value, which is not significant anyway, it varies a tiny bit from phase point to phase point, but you want to know sort of the, av the typical value, I should say, not average value, but the typical value. What, what all the phase points, the values they have for the macrovariance given some epsilon up to sub epsilon. If you want to know that, the one simple thing to do is just take the average. That's a more reasonable computation. You can do that and you're going to get the values which are going to be relevant to thermodynamic behavior. And not only that, as I emphasized earlier, by the very form, the exponential form of the Gibbs measure, the Gibbs formula, Gibbs ensemble, all that just naturally geared to give rise to all the thermodynamic relationships, all of thermodynamics. So that says you have in the Gibbs mechanism and Gibbs approach a, a, a model for thermodynamics. You just are missing what the meaning of the variables are. You're doing these funny averaging. But the very fact that these averages give you the correct, conceptually correct Boltzmann values, which is what you're really interested in, means at the end of the day, putting it all together, you get exactly what you want. And using the Gibbs, um, the Gibbs approach just gives you a convenient handle for getting the idealized thermodynamic formalism out. But you have to remember what you really were interested in to begin with. 
So you have a mathematical structure which is, which is of just the right form to get thermodynamic formalism, but it's naturally connected with the quantities of physical interest which are related to the Boltzmannian point of view. So these two approaches go hand in hand to give you a clear picture of what's going on and a clear understanding of your computations. And with that, I close. Yeah, you had a question. I just wanted to clarify something. When you said that the big set is not special because it's overwhelmingly large, so that's what's that does. You can call make you can say that makes it pretty special, but right. So you naturally end up there. I just wanted to uh, clarify when you say naturally, if we're working with classical deterministic laws, it's only natural if you posit the right Hirsch condition. But you would you the suppose it sort of turned out with this picture that in the real world you don't end up in the big set. You, you, it just didn't happen. Then you would be puzzled and then you would say, what the hell is going on? I need to understand that. But if you were wondering why, you are, why things settle down in such a way that, you, you, that after, after a short time things look the same, the picture sort of says, oh, I shouldn't have been so surprised. I shouldn't have been surprised about that because almost all the phase points in terms of the properties that I observe are the same then nobody actually can prove. Even though you have this picture, so you really feel like you have an understanding, that's not the same as a proof that that's really what happens. But nobody doubts it. Yes? Well, I would say it's giving you different information and basically the wrong. It's, I think it's just a failure to appreciate the thing, what you're using the probabilities for. They're extremely useful for making computations, but to say, oh, the fundamental entropy is a Gibbs entropy, which means, oh, I have a system and it's fundamentally described by a probability distribution. So what the hell is the meaning of that probability distribution? If you think that's the fundamental thing, you have to understand probability what? Whose probability? What the hell am I talking about? Wayne will talk some about that. But it, it, I think, you know, if you're taking too seriously that probability distribution as, as a probability of what? I mean, it, you're, now you're talking about time averages. The time averages which would be relevant would be infinite time averages. No. Well, it depends what you look at, but it's true that sometimes these you just don't need the time averaging. The quantities you're really interested in first understanding, those which are relevant to just simple thermodynamics. <laughs> simple thermodynamics, they basically are constant. They're not varying very much. So the time averaging is pretty much irrelevant there. If you want to look at do some more detailed kind of things and get a more detailed formalism than the thermodynamic fluctuation theory, microscopic fluctuation, then the time average, those kind of considerations are going to be relevant. But to inject them at its early stage where, where, where they're not necessary, that, that just puts you on the wrong track. Yes, Tim. Where it's likely to spend time in, given what the dynamics of the system are. I mean, I agree, you still have the same. 
Yeah, but you're, you're probably giving more than you want. I mean, there's a time and a place for everything. So it's a question of which problem, what phenomenon you want to understand. Maybe some time averages are going to be relevant. Well, when I was taught this stuff, I was told every physical quantity that thermodynamics is about concerns an infinite time average. And that, that was the end of the story. And once and you said the ergodic theorem takes care of that. And when, that, when I was told that, I, I realized later that I, this was just bullshit and, and that nobody took it seriously. Or, or if the people did take it seriously, they were deluding themselves. When I ask, you know, I often hear talks by ergodic theorists or whatever talking about the foundational issue of statistical mechanics. And they would say, oh, because they're going to prove some kind of ergodicity results. They'll say, well, it's absolutely fundamental to understand, to understand ergodicity. Then you ask, okay, so why is that fundamental? They say, I don't know. I had to write an NSF proposal. <laughs> yeah? Um, so if, if the Gibbs Boltzmann entropy only agrees when the rho is uniform over the massive space, then that means that they generally disagree. They, they certainly generally disagree. I don't know what you mean by that. If you use the Gibbs entropy properly, as I described what it means to use it properly, it'll be fine. Um, the correct entropy is the Boltzmann entropy if you're interested in thermodynamics. The reason it's kind of ridiculous to think of the, think about a situation where you have a, the system starts off in a little cell, not a uniformly distributed, whatever that means, uniformly distributed in some little cell in phase space. So you imagine, yeah, that's the initial probability. You don't know where exactly it is in the cell, so you make it uniform. That's a bit unrealistic too, but imagine that. Then after a long time, the thing is really, all, is really convoluted in a crazy way, and it's not going to correspond to anybody's knowledge of anything, that's for sure, because nobody can solve the equation. But is, you really take seriously that funny probability distribution at a later time corresponds to anything genuinely physical? It's, it's going to be something which can be useful to trying to prove something. But it's really these funny probability distributions which you get along the way. If you're interested in probability distributions and how they behave, that's fine. But if you're interested in what's happening in the real world, don't take the probabilities and distributions quite seriously enough until you know how you're using them in some proof. What do you give me a proposal? I mean, I don't know. It's nothing to distinguish from my point of view. I mean, there's just two different notions of entropy. What, what would be the empirics? What would be the test? I mean, in a given situation, to do actually some test in some weird case, I say, I have to know what is the probab what is D probability distribution. I have no clue what I should even think of as D probability distribution. Hard to imagine what kind of test you would even have in mind. I don't think there's a real question. That's right. That's what I meant at the beginning. Partly, there's a question. Oh, we have to make a decision which is the right one. But if you really understand what's going on, it's not really a question of which is the right one. To the extent when Gibbs entropy is useful, it's going to agree with Boltzmann entropy, and it, and, if you are, and it is very useful. But in those weird situations where it, where it deviates a lot, then what's, that's fine, and it's not useful there. Yes, Tim. Yes. Then there are the questions which are going to, and these two differ. You can just ask, well, which one looks like what you expect thermodynamic entropy that you're used to. Yeah, that's the, but they agree there. But they agree there. I, not, not, not for approaching equilibrium and stuff like that. Well, but then it's not thermodynamic entropy. There's nobody. That's what I'm saying. The shades are empirical. That, but, that, okay, if, look, I mean, the sense of fact that the Gibbs entropy doesn't change with time, if, if you needed any other argument, that's really not doing what you want it to do. I mean, it's, it's not behaving the way you want an entropy to behave. When I, when I was a student, somehow everybody took seriously the idea that Gibbs entropy was the right one. And somebody proposed, I remember, uh, some way of, uh, uh, this was considered the fundamental problem in foundations of statistical mechanics. How could entropy possibly increase? Because the Gibbs entropy, everybody took that's the right entropy, and that doesn't change. So that was a it was like the measurement problem in quantum mechanics, almost unsolvable. 
And it was a problem, just like in quantum mechanics, I would say, based on just a trivial mistake. You got the wrong concept here. It's the wrong entropy. That's why you're having trouble. But still, it was so, it was so entrenched that there was a prominent, some prominent physicist who, when they heard about some proposal for solving this problem, says it can't be funded because this problem is insolvable. Yeah, Barry. Anybody know what Jesus' gravestone looks like? Anybody? <laughs> So. I'm going to argue that Gibson himself has nothing to apologize to for because he didn't take the. Gibson himself didn't necessarily take the wrong steps to this failure. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. I think that's important, too. Yeah, yeah absolutely. No, Tolman did not. No, but Tolman's theorem is a bad theorem because it's a triviality which is mis very misleading, as, we, as we, Mark we, Katz pointed out. The coarse grained H theorem. The coarse grained H theorem. That, so that's a very misleading thing. Um, just, a, just, just a trivial convexity result which basically says nothing beyond what it says, which is something trivial. So, but, so Tolman was no Gibbs. <laughs>